chapter twelve of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve annie beauchamp conceives a strong partiality for the eldest miss perkins the acquaintance between mrs major allen barnaby and mrs colonel beauchamp ripens into the warmest friendship annie was the first who succeeded in her quest for she found the spinster sisters sitting most disconsolately in the great saloon without even the semblance of an occupation unless the ceaseless fanning of miss matilda could be called such and by no means in a state of spirits to render any conversation they might have together soothing or consolatory to either party as far as the exciting kind feelings in the breast of miss beauchamp could be advantageous to them their palpable and evident forlornness was in their favour she looked at them both for a moment and felt that english or not they were thoroughly uncomfortable and forlorn and had they sat with a pedigree in their hands instead of a feather fan a pedigree proving them to be descended in a direct line from general washington she could not have smiled more sweetly as she stepped forward to address them i am afraid ladies you must find it very dull here she said seating herself opposite and about midway between the two the new orleans boarding-houses are not very famous for having many books and it's so hot here in the daytime that strangers hardly dare venture into the streets either to look for books or anything else but mamma and i have plenty upstairs in our own rooms and we shall be very happy to lend you some if you like it from the moment she entered miss matilda who had for many hours been meditating on the possibility of coaxing mrs beauchamp evidently the principal personage of the boarding-house set into presenting them to some of her new orleans friends changed her attitude of ill at ease indolence into one of fascinating animation and she immediately replied thank you a thousand times my dear miss beauchamp how excessively kind and amiable yes my dear miss beauchamp i do indeed long for a few of the elegant indulgences to which i have ever been accustomed in my own country our residence is quite at the west end and i am perfectly sure that you are sufficiently well informed to be aware miss beauchamp that in london nothing gives more decided fashion than that in short the fact is that though i have no doubt in the world but that in a short time we shall like your country and all the charming people in it excessively yet just at this moment that is just at first you know we do find it rather dull annie's only answer to this was a sort of acquiescent bow and turning her eyes from the elegant speaker she fixed them then almost by accident on the pale face of poor louisa that really worthy but very unfortunate person felt at the bottom of her heart that in securing her beloved sister from suicide she had given up everything in the shape of worldly comfort and enjoyment which had hitherto made her own life desirable and that sister was now looking so exceedingly ugly old and thin that miss louisa who watched her with all the tender solicitude of a mother was falling fast into a profound melancholy from the conviction that though the promise she had extorted from her as the price of her own consent to this unhappy expedition might secure her from self-slaughter it would not secure her from hating the life so preserved for as she gazed upon her long pale peevish face she felt most miserably certain that no gentleman on god's earth who was in his right senses would ever think of such a thing as marrying her when therefore annie beauchamp's eye fell upon her her quiet and usually tranquil features were somewhat agitated by the thoughts that had taken possession of her mind and her light grey eyes which were not very large had more tears in them than they could conveniently hold but when she caught the glance of the young american fixed upon her she made an effort to smile and said in an accent that spoke a good deal of gratitude indeed young lady you are very kind annie immediately changed her seat for one that was close to her and taking her hand said cheerfully now then miss perkins tell me what sort of a book you like best shall it be grave or gay english or american prose or verse any book replied miss louisa very considerably comforted at being addressed so kindly any book or newspaper in the world would certainly be greatly more agreeable than sitting with nothing at all to do of any sort or kind but the greatest kindness of all would be to give us something that my sister matilda would like to read she is far greater reader than i am at all times my pleasure being more in seeing that everything is tidy and comfortable at home but poor matilda is very fond of a novel and if you chance to have a pretty love story that she never happened to meet with before i do think it would go further to raise up her spirits than anything and if i could but see her looking a little happy again it would quite set me up annie rose with the intention of immediately ransacking her little collection for love 
but as far as her own feelings were concerned it was greatly more for the sake of the elder sister than for the gratification of the younger but miss matilda stopped her ere she reached the door exclaiming oh do not go my dear miss beauchamp a little of your delightful conversation will do me more good than all the novels in the world my elder sister is one of the very best and most ladylike people in the world i do assure you though at present of course you see her to a disadvantage so very little dressed as she is and all that but though she is quite superior as to her fortune and station in life and all those sort of advantages yet i won't pretend that at her age she would be likely to enjoy a comfortable chat with a young person like you in the same way that i should do i need not point out to you the difference there is between us in age it is quite extraordinary isn't it a great many people won't believe that we are sisters but i was going to say if you happen to have a newspaper there is nothing in the world that louisa likes so well and then while she is poring over that you and i can talk miss beauchamp answered not a word to this and we have therefore no right perhaps to be less discreet concerning her feelings than she was herself but though she spoke not she bit her beautiful underlip severely and if she had been sufficiently imprudent to speak at all it would have been in a manner but little likely to assist the object confided to her by her mamma she appeared however to be entirely occupied by taking a thorn out of her finger and turned to the window in order to attain the degree of light necessary to this delicate operation and then after the delay of a moment she again turned to leave the room saying that she would return again in a moment what a kind sweet-tempered young thing said miss louisa as soon as the door was closed a very nice girl indeed replied her sister her eyes are rather too large and her hair too abundant and too dark to satisfy my ideas of perfect feminine beauty but nevertheless she is certainly very pretty-looking and most uncommonly agreeable considering she has never seen london nor even cheltenham or brighton i hope we shall become exceedingly intimate for i think we shall suit exactly i have got dreadfully tired of poor dear patty and that's the truth though of course i don't mean to let any of em find it out but upon my word it is enough to make anybody sick hearing her run on so everlasting about her husband and to tell you the truth louisa i am terribly afraid her husband begins to think so too for it is not once nor twice either that i have seen him yawn as if his jaws would crack when she has been kissing him and it is plain enough poor thing that she does not at all approve his taking so much notice of any one else for i have got some terrible sour looks from her on board ship when he has ventured to come where i was standing to watch the flying fish or anything of that kind away she was after him in a minute but i am sure she need not have been afraid for the very last thing i should ever think of doing would be encouraging the attentions of a friend's husband oh dear no i am sure you would not do any such thing as that matilda said her sister looking rather surprised and shocked at the suggestion but i can't say here she was interrupted by the return of annie with three thin volumes of unmistakable circulating library complexion in one hand and a grey tinted newspaper in the other setting the books down on a table by which she passed miss beauchamp approached the meek louisa with a newspaper i am afraid this will not entertain you so well as a london newspaper would do miss perkins but at least you will find one half column down here that is all about england and you must not be angry if you do not find it very civil because our newspaper people think there is no opportunity of serving their own country at once so profitable and so cheap as by abusing yours this was said in a tone and spirit so very different from that in which a short hour or so before the same young lady had discoursed on the subject of england to mr egerton that any person hearing both may be well tempted to accuse her of inconsistency and really i know no defence for her save that she was a young lady a class which from long usage by this time grown into something like prescriptive privilege holds itself exempt from the necessity of always being of the same opinion i am very much obliged to you indeed said miss louisa receiving the odd-looking pages with a smile of genuine pleasure and gratitude it is so very kind of you to think about me and while annie stood beside her she turned her eyes to the paper and began reading it to show perhaps that she really did take a great interest in a newspaper the first and indeed as it seemed the only thing which particularly attracted her attention however on the present occasion was a succession of little dingy pictures one of which appeared to adorn every paragraph in the page which first happened to meet her eye what are all these little men running meant for said miss louisa looking up very innocently in the face of her new friend is it to make the newspaper look pretty annie laughed no miss perkins she replied 
neither the portraits or the originals of these running gentry are counted very pretty in the united states no these figures are intended for use not ornament they are placed there to call the attention of the reader to the advertisement which follows which is always about some runaway slave or other and is to give notice that any one who finds him or her for the ladies sometimes run as well as the gentlemen is to catch them and send them back to their owners miss louisa though as i have said a very worthy woman was not a very well informed one and knew as little about the great transatlantic subject of negro slavery as most people nevertheless she had heard of such a thing and in a general way considered it like the rest of the european world men women and children to be something exceedingly atrocious and unchristian without the very slightest affectation therefore for there was no such thing in her she shuddered visibly as her beautiful companion uttered the above words and exclaimed involuntarily oh dear oh dear how very shocking that sounds miss beauchamp coloured slightly and turned away i have brought you some books ma'am she said addressing herself to matilda after the silence of a moment i am sorry i cannot stay with you any longer but i am obliged to be upstairs miss matilda began a flourishing speech about sorrow at losing her and gratitude for her books but before she had half finished the young lady had given them both a valedictory nod and disappeared the situation of both sisters was however essentially improved louisa had not only her newspaper to read which despite its melancholy pictures was a great deal better than nothing but she had also the great the very great consolation of seeing her sister look ten years younger and twenty times less discontented than before the fair annie had paid them her unexpected visit and before she had got three volumes of native manufactory concerning love and matrimony to read nor did these favourable symptoms altogether disappear even when she discovered that her book though exceedingly interesting was not without its faults the greatest of which in her eyes was the gross absurdity committed by the author in introducing his heroine as already in the perfection of beauty at the ridiculous age of sixteen this blunder so strongly affected her that she actually began to think aloud and exclaimed without any intention of consulting her sister on the subject what a pity to spoil the whole interest by such nonsense as that any rational person who knows anything of human nature must be constantly expecting to hear of her being whipped and put to bed for some childish naughtiness or other there is but one way of my finding any interest in the story i am quite sure and that way i shall take for it seems beautifully written and full of the most touching sentiments i shall just consider it a misprint and correct sixteen into six and twenty at the very least perhaps at the bottom of her heart might have lurked the thought that to produce the perfection of full-grown female sensibility another ten years might have been added with very manifest advantage to the interest and the truth of the story but notwithstanding these drawbacks of young love on the one hand and negro slavery on the other both the sisters felt themselves considerably better than they had done since they landed on the shores of the united states the position meanwhile of the real heroine of these pages was still more essentially improved at the same time that her daughter went to visit the miss perkinses mrs beauchamp by the aid of the black waiting-maid cleopatra sought and found the retreat of mrs allen barnaby the major having as usual wandered to a billiard-table his lady was left in undisturbed possession of her chamber and was employing herself at the moment her new friend entered in preparing for her important literary undertaking being in the act of writing down in a little black paper-book which she had just sewed up for the purpose the heads of various subjects to which she immediately intended to direct her attention nothing could exceed the pleasure she felt at seeing mrs beauchamp accept what she expressed she immediately laid down her pen and hastening towards her performed a ceremonious curtsey while she frankly extended her hand which was intended to typify and express as it were all the stately dignity of the old world combined with the unsophisticated cordiality of the new i hope i don't break in upon you ma'am at a time that don't convene said mrs beauchamp i see that you are already got to your writing which agrees with what your good gentleman told me but now was the employment as was most likely to occupy you just at the present and for that very reason my dearest mrs beauchamp replied the animated mrs allen barnaby i am enchanted beyond what i am able to express at your having the excessive kindness to call on me it is here only mrs beauchamp in the retirement of my own apartment that such a visit can be duly appreciated i dare say my excellent husband major allen barnaby one of the best of men mrs beauchamp 
i dare say he may have ventured to hint to you that my purpose in coming to this most interesting of countries is in effect to do the very exact thing of which you were so eloquently speaking last night yes mrs allen barnaby he has indeed ma'am replied the visitor and i can't say but what i heard the news with very particular pleasure seeing that you are a lady so every way qualified to perform the work proposed with honour to yourself and satisfaction to those about whose concerns it is your intention to instruct the world and if you do this ma'am you will have the glory of achieving just what nobody else that has tried has ever been able to do yet if i should indeed be so happy replied mrs allen barnaby modestly casting her eyes upon the ground i feel sure that i shall owe it to you i certainly did come to this country solely for the purpose of writing upon it but i always felt even when most eager to undertake the task that i must fail as so many others have done before me unless i had the good fortune to form an acquaintance with some accomplished person of my own sex who should be induced to assist me by counsel and information such as of course none but a native can give and it is that very thought of yours ma'am i will venture to say that will certify your success replied her new friend it is just exactly what nobody has ever done before and it is for that very reason i expect that no traveller has ever yet produced a book upon the union that can justly be called fit to be read heaven grant that by your assistance i may avoid their errors cried mrs allen barnaby fervently casting her eyes towards the ceiling of the room i can safely say that no one ever undertook a task which caused greater anxiety or a more ardent desire of success there is no doubt of it mrs allen barnaby no doubt whatever of your success i mean nor of all the rewards in this world and the next which you will so well deserve to receive replied mrs beauchamp with an ardour which was considerably more sincere than that of her companion you will indeed have every advantage she resumed for not only will you see things without prejudice by being made to understand them really as they are but from having been in the habit of writing so much in the old country you must have got the knack of it as we say and will find the work come to your hand quite easy i expect yes my dear mrs beauchamp i have written a great deal replied mrs allen barnaby with a modest meditative air and though during several years of certainly very successful publication a feeling of timidity perhaps too long indulged has prevented my ever meeting the public face to face as i may call it under my real name i cannot now as you well observe feel any of the difficulties of a mere novice i shall on the contrary set about my task with that delightful sensation of confidence which conscious ability i believe always gives do not impute vanity to me my dear madam for my saying this but the fact is that it would be the most contemptible affectation were i to pretend ignorance of the admiration which my writings have produced i have never published anything i can truly say from the moment i first handled a pen without its meeting the most brilliant success and it would show a great want of common sense on my part were i to pretend now to fear that i should fail and with such a theme too it would indeed be folly for any one to suppose such a thing possible replied mrs beauchamp but yet i cannot help thinking she added after the meditation of a minute or two i cannot help thinking mrs allen barnaby that you might bring your work forward in a superior sort of style as i may say if you would just consent to put in the title page by the author of whatever previous works of yours have had the greatest success i really would strongly advise you to think again and again of this before you finally make up your mind against it do not mention the subject to me again i entreat of you mrs beauchamp returned the european lady with some slight display of impatience you know not to be sure it is impossible that you should know how eternally i have been i may say persecuted in england with the same request and having resisted the most earnest entreaties of persons of station even too high for me to venture to name can you really think that i ought to yield to any other i feel quite certain that when you have thought a little more about it mrs beauchamp and when you have brought yourself to recollect that there are in our country persons or at any rate one person 
whom it is by no means easy to refuse you will perceive and acknowledge the necessity of my continued reserve why as to that mrs allen barnaby returned the republican lady i have no great notion of any one person being such a vast long way before all the rest as you seem to make out and to say the truth i can't realize to myself the possibility of such an elegant smart woman as you are being chained up in that way as i may call it by any one why there's our president now he's first and foremost in course because it has been our will and pleasure to make him so but lord bless your soul mrs allen barnaby he might ask any one of us to do anything from july to eternity and it would never come into our heads to do it unless indeed for some profitable object of our own which is quite another thing and what all sensible men will calculate upon doing at all times but for giving way to him for any other reason he may march from washington very considerably east of sunrise before he will find anybody ready to do any such meanness however we won't talk any more about politics just at present and instead of it i want you to show me what you have jotted down there and mrs beauchamp with a little natural and national curiosity did just peep at the foolscap page which lay half filled in large characters after the manner of a list before mrs allen barnaby that lady's m s however was not as it seemed yet ready for examination for with a good deal of dignified mystery she laid a blank sheet over that upon which she had written and said not yet dearest mrs beauchamp not yet if you please though this very paper which i now conceal is written expressly that i may communicate it to you but as yet i am not fully prepared to do it it will contain when filled up a list of questions to be addressed to yourself on the particular themes that i shall consider it most necessary to touch upon in the course of my work and may i not hope that you will kindly condescend to answer them and that's just what my very heart is longing and burning to do replied mrs beauchamp her handsome face in a glow of patriotic excitement and i do hope it won't be long before you are ready to begin if any immediate arrangements for our being a good deal together can be made my dearest lady i should be ready to begin our important consultations directly in short the major has promised to bring me home several whole quires of paper to-day besides a large quantity of pens and a bottle of ink so you may see my dear madam from my giving him such a commission that i have no intention to delay the business however i charged him to buy the paper at different shops for fear of creating suspicion of what i was about i always took the same precaution in london when i began a new work dear me did you really how very cautious and then her curiosity whetted anew by this allusion to mystery mrs beauchamp once more ventured to return to the forbidden subject and added do now just tell me the name of the least and littlest of all your books mrs allen barnaby coloured violently through her rouge and for a moment felt convinced that the interesting history of her anonymous fame was suspected but when she ventured to look again at the animated countenance of mrs beauchamp she perceived with the greatest possible satisfaction that she was altogether mistaken nothing was to be seen there but the most respectful admiration excepting indeed that little imp-like sparkle of curiosity which peeped out of her eyes and which under the circumstances would certainly have been pardonable in any daughter of eve but in a transatlantic one the want of it would have been nothing less than unnatural mrs allen barnaby therefore again rallied her spirits and played off with great ability the part of an embarrassed and somewhat agitated incognita to whom the removal of the veil would be excessively distressing while the preserving it was exceedingly difficult at length the scene reached its climax by her putting her handkerchief to her eyes and exclaiming spare me my dearest mrs beauchamp spare me the time shall come when i will have no reserves with you but your own admirable judgment must tell you that just at this moment when my nerves are naturally shaken by the contemplation of an undertaking which i feel to be almost awfully important there would be great weakness in my suffering my spirits to be agitated by my making a disclosure which i am well aware would at once bring me upon the eyes of all america as well as of all europe 
i implore you therefore for the present to make no further allusion to my former writings but rather let us employ the precious minutes with which you favour me by arranging how i can in the most effectual manner be thrown into the circle among which you usually live in order to catch as much as possible your views and opinions upon all subjects well then returned mrs beauchamp with the most perfect good humour i expect i won't plague you one bit more at present as you say about the works that have made your false name so celebrated not but what i give one of my fingers to know what the name was however we will say no more about it now and instead of it i will tell you what my scheme is for our passing as much time together as possible i calculate in course mrs allen barnaby that your plan in writing upon the union is to travel through all the most celebrated and wonderful parts of it most assuredly replied the authoress with decision well then my plan is to travel too returned mrs beauchamp because then you know as the things come in all their glory before our eyes i can explain them to you and make you realize their particular excellence at the first blush as i may say what do you say to that plan mrs allen barnaby that it is the most admirable the most perfect the most inconceivably kind that could possibly have entered your head and that so inspired i must be dull indeed if i fail but what does the colonel and your beautiful daughter say to it my dear mrs beauchamp oh annie is delighted she has long been dying for a travelling frolic and she undertakes to do the honours to your friends which will leave us to our studies you know as to the colonel to say the truth i have not yet mentioned the subject to him but he is i do expect the very best man alive and i am sure he will make no objection provided the major can smoke a cigar and play a game of piquet can he mrs allen barnaby the major is very fond of smoking replied our heroine and i rather think too she added gently that he now and then likes a game at piquet well then i will answer for all the rest resumed the energetic mrs beauchamp her patriotic ardour animating her even to her fingers ends which were already itching as she said to be at her packing the colonel will be back in a few minutes to take his morning iced julep and then i will tell him all about it mrs beauchamp was by no means talking without her host when she said that if the major smoked cigars and played piquet she could answer for all the rest of course she was too clever a woman not to know how to set the thing properly before the eyes of her husband she said little or nothing to him concerning her project of redeeming the reputation of the united states and undoing all the mischief which former travellers had perpetrated against this brutally treated portion of the earth's service by taking the pen of mrs allen barnaby under her especial influence and control she said little or nothing of all this because she knew that although her husband was as a matter of course an excellent patriot what american is not yet nevertheless the sluggish circulation of his blood which without greatly injuring his bodily health had reduced his mental energies very nearly to the condition of those of a dormouse prevented his greatly enjoying any long discussions on the subject what she chiefly dwelt upon therefore was the great delight which his darling annie would enjoy from travelling in the society of this very distinguished english party and also the providential circumstance of their meeting with a gentleman who could both smoke cigars and play piquet and thus render the performance of his long-given promise of taking his daughter about a little a matter of pleasure instead of annoyance very well my dear was the colonel's first answer manage it just as you like if it's a good boat i shall be quite ready to start end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the barnabys in america by francis melton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen some interesting passages in the progressive attachment of mesdames barnaby and beauchamp the american lady hints a wish to see the dresses of the english one compliance is promised but a short delay requested when major allen barnaby learned from his wife that the travelling party to be composed in the manner already agreed upon by the two ladies was actually arranged he smiled very good-humouredly and said that's all very well my barnaby and a capital hand you are to set a machine in action but you don't quite calculate do you 
as these curious fellows say upon my being ready to pack up and to go away at a moment's warning you do not in sober earnest expect that do you those words of doubt and dread came like a thunderbolt or rather like an avalanche for nothing could be more chilling on the ears and heart of poor mrs allen barnaby never having been from her earliest infancy in the habit of doubting her own powers she had no sooner fully conceived the scheme of writing a book then a well-assured and very brilliant success immediately rose before her mind's eye as being perfectly certain and that too no mere idle windy wordy success born in the drawing-room and buried on the staircase but solid profitable money-getting success that might do as much to help them forward or very nearly so as one of the major's best games at piquet in curzon street and overlooking the possibility that her husband's view of the case might not be precisely the same as her own she felt as much shocked and disappointed at hearing him thus speak to her as if he had suddenly declared that he meant to turn hermit and for the future should require no money at all the dismay expressed by her countenance was so great and to say the truth so comical that the major for one moment laughed outright but this was a species of amusement that upon principle he rarely indulged in and before the fire which he saw mounting to his lady's eyes had fully flashed upon him the foolish fit was over and his laugh exchanged for a smile of the most amiable domestic amenity come come wife said he you must not take what i say too gravely either and i cannot help laughing when i see you getting it into your head that i mean to take up my dwelling in this cursed place and remain here to be broiled everlastingly set your heart at rest upon that point my barnaby if you are in such haste to be off it's lucky for you perhaps that the said here are just what they are why my dear will you believe it i don't think that out of the thirty or forty playing men that i have either tried myself or watched others try i don't believe that out of the whole number there's half a dozen that isn't as keen-witted as myself you understand me now that won't do you know by any means what's good play or a sharp eye or the help of tornarino or anything else with such a set of fellows the difference between london and new orleans seems to be just this on our side of the water there's a population of flats with just a respectable sprinkling of sharps among them to keep men from going to sleep and sinking into absolute stupidity but here upon my honour and soul the whole population old and young strikes me as being sharps with such a scanty supply of flats amongst them as it breaks one's spirit to think of and as for the diamond cut diamond sort of business that is carried on here it would not suit me at all i am not used to it and i am not quite so young as i was my dear and ceaseless never-ending hard work don't suit me i won't say but what i might be a match for them if i tried hard for it but the profit would be little or none for after a fair trial between me and most of em i am greatly mistaken if we should not one and all come to pretty nearly the same conclusion and that would just be to let one another alone but how do these gentlemen make the thing answer themselves my dear donny demanded his wife with her usual shrewdness why i suppose by watching for every new arrival like sharks after a dead body he replied but that would never answer for us my dear barnaby besides if it did they would get so confounded jealous of me being an englishman that i should have no peace of my life no wife i shan't stay here i promise you you have no reason to be terrified by that notion but you have not lost anything to speak of yet have you my dear said she her own satisfaction at the idea of their departure being for a moment lost sight of in her domestic anxiety for the well-doing of every member of her beloved family you have not paid very dear i hope for what you have learned no my dear he replied that is not my way and i should have thought you might have guessed as much no i thought i detected something the first night just before the party broke up that looked a little like a determination to let me win but i was not sure of it so last night i became a good deal more heedless and gay-hearted you see than before and then i saw ay and heard too what put me up to them why they had found me out in no time and all their scheming was not to get the better of me but to get me dropped out of the one or two set two games they had been planning where they had got something like a novice to work at so i very quietly let them have their way about it and i think that puzzled them again a little well that's only the fun of a moment mind you and would not last i'll engage for it long enough to make me sure of a dozen dollars however we can't suppose you know that they are all finished up in this high style in every part of the union and further on i hope we shall fare better my barnaby 
i shall do very well by and by i dare say so don't look uneasy about it heaven grant we may fare better my dear replied his wife for confident as i am of the success of my work it will by no means do donny for us all to depend upon it you know no my dear said he very demurely i don't think it will nevertheless wife i do not intend mind you to set off post haste just after what happened last night they would understand it exactly as well as you do and a little better too perhaps for you will be thinking naturally enough that your book has something to do with it while they'd know well enough every mother's son of them that coming out here to see what i could do i had met with my match and was off to find game less wild elsewhere and i'll leave you to judge the sort of introduction that would follow after me so if you please my dear love we will not start in a bustle and you must please to tell your new friend mrs beauchamp who i suspect manages her husband more completely than even you do yours my barnaby that you intend to begin your examination of their magnificent country here and you may ask her if you will to introduce you about a little everybody seems to know them and i am told that beauchamp has the finest estate and the largest gang of slaves in all carolina however well mrs allen barnaby might manage her donny she knew what if you please my dear love meant as well as an old mare on a common knows the length of her tether and she therefore hazarded not one word of objection to this prolonged abode at new orleans though she not only longed with extreme impatience to set off on the progress which her new friend had sketched out to her in such inviting colours but she also earnestly desired to remove herself from an atmosphere where she was perpetually uttering prayers the very reverse of hamlet's and wishing that her too too melting flesh were more solid and not thawing and dissolving itself into dew as it did at present there was however something in the idea of being introduced into new orleans society by a person whom everybody knew and who had the finest estate and largest gang of slaves in carolina which was very consolatory and like a wise woman she immediately fixed her thoughts and brought her conversation to bear on this most agreeable portion of her husband's discourse that is a capital good idea of yours major said she about my asking mrs beauchamp to introduce us as if just for the purpose you know of enabling me to describe the society in my book and with that notion in her head she will pick out the very best and genteelest see if she don't i have no doubt of it he replied with a sagacious nod and i shall choose my dear to be included in this visiting for i know of old that new orleans is accounted one of the first places for play of its size anywhere and that makes me think that it's likely enough coming here as a stranger with my family and all so very respectable and domestic i may do better in these drawing-rooms for the time we stay than i have any chance of doing among the regular set at the gaming-tables so i don't care how soon you set about talking to her on this subject and you may say you know that in a new place as this is to you it has always been your rule to go nowhere unaccompanied by your excellent husband you understand me oh yes perfectly my dear and i'll do the thing as it ought to be done you may depend upon it but i say donny dear there is no occasion is there for me to take those poor dear lanky-looking perkinses with me everywhere it will be all very well when we are in lodgings anywhere that we should all be together because if it's the same here as in london that makes a great difference in paying for the drawing-room but it will be a dreadful bore won't it if we can never go out anywhere without them i am sure i don't know who'll ever ask us on that point my dear i have not a word to say replied the major shaking his head it is one of those female ladylike mysteries with which i positively can have nothing to do it was you my dear and your daughter patty that arranged their coming with us and now if you like it you may arrange that they shall be sent back again if you had requested to bring mother redcap i should have consented provided she could have paid her expenses and if you had her here i should let you do precisely what you liked with her but i must not be plagued about it mrs barnaby no more you shall dear i'll manage all that and now be off with you there's a good man for i shall have mrs beauchamp knocking at my door in a minute and by what i hear the boarding ladies say to one another they would be shocked dreadfully to find you here shocked to find me in my own room wife said the major somewhat surprised yes they would indeed it does seem droll to be sure but mrs beauchamp says that every lady's chamber as she calls it is considered in all the boarding-houses the genteelest place to receive company lady company of course 
and therefore that the husbands are never permitted to be there well then i'm off i'll just ramble about a little among the billiard tables this morning but i shall be devilish careful how i play so you must not be over anxious my dear the sociable anticipations of mrs allen barnaby were not disappointed for hardly had the major disappeared before as she had predicted the gentle ladylike knock of mrs beauchamp was heard at the door the well-pleased tenant of the chamber confined not her welcome to the ordinary words come in but hastening to the door threw it open to its widest extent and did everything that smiles nods hand pressings and rejoicing expletives could do to prove the delight which the visit gave her the two ladies then seated themselves on a comfortable sofa and smilingly began to compare notes on the explanatory interviews that they had had with their respective husbands since their conversation of the preceding morning both declared that far from finding any difficulty the plan they had formed had met with the most cordial approbation from the gentleman both concluding her agreeable statement nearly in the same words namely i must say that whenever i particularly wish anything the colonel or the major very rarely opposes me and then having reached this point mrs allen barnaby said quite as a matter of course that some short time however must be given to becoming better acquainted with the charming town they were in for that it would be dreadful to write a book on america and find nothing to say of so very fine a city as new orleans god bless my soul i never thought of that exclaimed mrs beauchamp with the look and voice of a sincere penitent most perfectly true to be sure most perfectly true i shall never forgive myself i do think for ever dreaming that you could start as we talked right away up the river with never a word said of such a glory of a city as new orleans i expect i had better not tell this tale against myself at mrs carmichael's dinner-table for i shall get more sour looks than would be at all agreeable however we'll both of us remember the proverb less said is soonest mended and never say a word about it you understand me my dear lady yes to be sure you must mrs allen barnaby she continued after meditating a moment you must see the theatres both french and american and the glorious keys and the magnificent levee and we must get to the place where you'll be sure to see the most steamboats together such a sight as you never saw before i calculate and then the market oh such a market every individual thing coming by the river and no other earthly way so smooth such a current and so unaccountable beautiful and then there will be the shops you london ladies will find the difference between these shops and yours i expect for here it is altogether one and the same thing as if you went into the shops at paris even down to the talking french behind the counters which we calculate gives a very genteel air to the town being foreign-like without being english which is what as you want to know everything you will excuse me for saying we prefer but i have little or no doubt my dear mrs allen barnaby that when your book appears such a book as between us i am sure will be able to make it all those little unpleasant feelings will wear away and you will come to be quite as popular among us as the french themselves heaven grant your delightful prophecy may come true my dear madam returned mrs allen barnaby every feature as she listened expressive of attention and deep respect that it should prove so is i may truly say the first and dearest wish of my heart but it seems to me my dear mrs beauchamp that notwithstanding the many interesting things you have mentioned you have omitted one that is almost i think the most important of all have i indeed exclaimed mrs beauchamp looking in no degree displeased by the remark but i have no doubt you are right it is indeed a great deal more likely that you should be right than not for this country from end to end is so crammed full of wonders of one sort or another that i expect one must have a most unaccountable good memory not to forget some of them but tell me my dear lady what is the particular thing you mean it is your own fault my dear mrs beauchamp replied the anxious inquirer if i do think it is the most important of all replied mrs allen barnaby with a very charming smile if i had never seen or conversed with you i might not perhaps have been so very desirous of acquiring the power of describing the society of the country 
this is it which i must confess strikes me as the most important feature of all especially in such sort of work as that which i intend to produce and you are right i guess as sure as there's a sun in heaven no doubt about it and what in the world i could be thinking of to suppose you could begin even for a single page without that is more than i can guess i promise you i suppose i thought that was sure to come as a matter of course and so i suppose it would in the long run but you are a deal more smart and thoughtful than i am in turning your mind to it from the very first luckily there's no time lost as yet however and a few notes of my writing to some of the people at first standing in the town will settle the matter at once i know not said mrs allen barnaby with much feeling while her jocund heart fluttered in her bosom as she remembered the trunks full of fine furbelowed dresses she had brought from london indeed i know not how i can never thank you enough for all the trouble you are taking for me all i can say is that you will not find an ungrateful heart all i can do and ten times more mrs allen barnaby may be out and out repaid i expect if you will but exert your talents for us replied mrs beauchamp all i want in return is that you should portray us to the world for just what we really are and that is the finest nation upon the surface of god's whole earth and as far ahead in civilization of europe in general and england in particular as the summer is before winter in heat on that point fear nothing replied mrs allen barnaby with a sort of concentrated earnestness that seemed quite sublime to mrs beauchamp my bosom seems to have received a spark from yours and glows warmly and i trust brightly with the desire of teaching the world where to look for and where to find all that is noblest in man but tell me my dear friend permit me to call you so tell me in what style do the ladies dress at the parties to which you so kindly propose introducing us will feathers be considered as too full dress i have many sets that are exceedingly magnificent but on this point i shall really wish to be entirely guided by you well then ma'am i may say in return that for the most part the ladies of new orleans don't consider any dress whatever as too elegant for their parties and provided your feathers come from paris i don't in the least question but what they will be very much approved perhaps mrs allen barnaby as we are on such comfortable and clever terms together you might not object to my just looking over your dresses it is what we american ladies don't at all scruple to ask from one another and i expect that there's few females to be found anywhere as better understands the thing than we do it is quite impossible that mrs beauchamp could have made any request with which mrs allen barnaby would have complied with greater pleasure partly by the aid of the ready money which had floated round them during their few months prosperous abode in london and partly from the credit which had resulted from it mrs allen barnaby had contrived to rig herself out as she called it with a prodigious quantity of fine clothes nearly the first thought which crossed her mind when informed by her husband that she must prepare to cross the atlantic was how she should be able to convey these treasures with her she had pulled them and caused them to be pulled forth from their various repositories and probably any woman of nerves less firm than her own would on seeing the accumulation have abandoned the idea of conveying them all with her as a thing impossible but not so my heroine as we are told is often the case with the noblest minds difficulties on such an occasion as this only seemed to generate strength throughout her whole frame a new a very new and original thought struck her as she gazed at the masses of velvet and satin piled around her in her curzon street bedroom on the afternoon of the day which succeeded her celebrated ball for one short moment indeed her spirit seemed overwhelmed and she muttered the word impossible but in the next the thought above alluded to suggested itself she fell into an attitude of deep meditation the forefinger of her left hand pressed to her forehead the right hand extended as if to forbid the approach of any one to interrupt her and her eyes closed for a few minutes she stood thus silently and wholly absorbed then arousing herself from the sort of trance into which she seemed to have fallen she said to the abigail who stood staring at her where were all the hampers put that brought in the wine which your master ordered when we first came into the house i don't rightly know i'm sure ma'am replied the woman but i somehow think they are in the coal-hole 
coal hole repeated her mistress with a natural shudder you mean one of the cellars i suppose you vulgar creature such a house as this has no coal hole just go to the linen press upstairs and bring down all the sheets and tablecloths you can find eh and all the towels too make haste i shall be back in a minute a mind of less intense energy would probably have contented itself by issuing orders for an examination of the contents of the coal cellar but that of mrs allen barnaby was differently constituted she penetrated herself to the dusky and dusty region herself held high the candle which enabled her to reconnoitre its contents and herself witnessed the drawing forth of hamper after hamper from its remotest corner a mind of less intense energy too might considering the purpose to which she desired to apply these hampers have shrunk and felt appalled at the dingy condition in which she found them but no weakness of the kind shook even for a moment her firm and steadfast purpose she bade the cook the page and the coachman who all stood staring at her from the area to lug them out and then she bade them take sundry brooms and brush them and then she bade them use the handles of the said brooms to beat and shake them and finally she bade them take them all being eight in number and of a goodly size their straw abstracted from within and the coal dust as far as might be from without to her own sleeping apartment and there deposit them the menials wondered but obeyed this done she quickly followed the eight hampers and quickly was rewarded too by finding how perfect was the success of her expedient guarded by the linen wrappers in which with all the tenderness of a fond parent she herself enveloped her treasures she gradually saw her satins her silks her laces and her velvets absorbed before her eyes till nothing remained to look upon but eight hampers our retrospect has already been too long and we therefore must not dwell upon the delightful feeling with which the labour thus accomplished inspired its projector suffice it to say that madame tornorino as nearly as she could followed her mamma's example that not a candle-box or crockery crate was left unoccupied and that few ladies ever quitted their native shores leaving less of what they loved behind than did the mother and daughter of our history but all these treasures or at least by far the greater and more precious part of them were still reposing in their wicker tabernacles awaiting the necessity now apparently so delightfully near of being called forth again into action it is scarcely exaggeration to say that every fibre of their animated owner's frame felt a quiver of delight as she remembered what she had to show and listened to the invitation to display it but some delay was however inevitable the effect of dragging forth her splendid draperies from the unseemly recesses of a wine-hamper was in a moment so graphically present to the soul of mrs allen barnaby that despite her eagerness she ventured to refer her friend to the morrow for the gratification of a curiosity which it was very evident she would have preferred gratifying to-day but when the stately mrs allen barnaby said with dignity my travelling trunks my dear madam have not all as yet been conveyed to my apartment mrs beauchamp became aware that it was no good to press the matter farther and curtsied herself off with an assurance that she would certainly not forget to write the notes she had mentioned and had no doubt whatever that lots of invitations would follow End of chapter thirteen chapters fourteen and fifteen of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen bribery skilfully employed produces great results the happiness of being reunited to what we love major allen barnaby very nearly quarrels with his lady but her admirable judgment and sweetness restore her good humour those among my readers who have studied the character of mrs allen barnaby with the attention it deserves will easily believe that she lost no time in setting about the business that must of necessity precede her keeping her promise to mrs beauchamp the absence of the major at this moment and indeed that of his son-in-law too was exceedingly provoking they were both tall strong men and she knew pretty well that it was not very likely either of them would venture to refuse their assistance to her had they been within reach of her commands but of their whereabouts she knew nothing and the job as she told herself must be set about instantly but mrs allen barnaby had great ability which never showed itself to greater advantage than when she was called upon by the exigencies of the moment to put herself and everybody else that she could influence into a bustle for one moment and no more she paused to think how she should begin and then rang the bell sharply cleopatra answered it instantly with the usual negro grin that seems ever to promise poor wretches willing obedience 
mrs allen barnaby stood ready with a little silver coin commonly called in those regions a fip in her hand i have got a rather tough job to get through my girl said she and if you will set to and help me i'll give you this money is perhaps of all sources of earthly joy what a slave loves the best and though a negro eye does not sparkle those of cleopatra gleamed forth a look of great delight and extending her strangely white palm so different in hue from the rest of her skin she said please missis i's ready to do everything that is more than i want cleopatra said the dignified lady with a very condescending smile all i want is that you should go into that outhouse at the back of the yard you know behind the kitchen where all our luggage was put that came from the custom-house and get some of the other blacks to help you to bring up into this room all the hampers you can find there do you understand is all the nigger blacks to share dis share and share alike ma'am demanded the disappointed cleopatra holding out her fip to the lady no cleopatra no that is for yourself alone put it in your pocket and say nothing about it to anybody when all the hampers are brought into this room and all the deal boxes and the great earthenware crate into the room of my daughter madame tornarino i will give a levy to be divided among the people that help you if i do it all my own self will missis give me the levy asked cleopatra very coaxingly i will give the levy whenever the things are all brought up replied mrs allen barnaby but i tell you cleopatra that you can't do it by yourself it is perfectly impossible cleopatra answered nothing but grinned and departed during her absence mrs allen barnaby arranged her room in the best manner she could devise for the reception of the ponderous baggage she expected and this done she sought and found her daughter and the two miss perkinses whom she informed of what was going on and then requested that they would all come into her room to assist her i'll be hanged if i do though replied madame tornorino and while i'm slaving for you mamma i wonder who's to unpack my own things i was just talking to matilda about them when you came in wasn't i matilda she added addressing her friend with a wink which demanded an affirmative i'll tell you what we'll do mamma and that will be all fair and no tyranny which nobody you know can abide in this free country which is news that i have just learned from mrs grimes i'll tell you what we'll do you shall take matilda and i'll take louisa because i like her best for this sort of thing and then we can both set to work fair and above board the two sisters eagerly proclaimed themselves perfectly ready to perform everything that was required of them and mrs allen barnaby finding she could do no better submitted to the arrangement whereupon the party who were during the discussion assembled in the apartment of madame tornarino divided two ladies remaining where they were while the other two proceeded across a wide corridor to the domain of mrs allen barnaby but just as miss matilda and her respected friend reached the top of the stairs which they passed in their way to its entrance they were greeted by the sight of a huge hamper that seemed making its own way up the staircase the figure of cleopatra was in fact totally hid by the wide burden she had deposited on her head but the next moment made it visible as without looking to the right or to the left the steadily balanced black machine passed on with quite as little attention to what it meant as a steam-engine the two ladies followed miss matilda wondering for she knew not of the hamper scheme and mrs allen barnaby delighted ever since her arrival she had endured a sort of undefined anxiety about the time and manner of her reunion with the treasures which that hamper and its fellows contained she knew indeed or at any rate she believed that those treasures were safe nay that they were as it might be said near her but there was something so unusual so impracticable in the nature of their envelopments that difficulty uncertainty and opposition seemed to overhang her tangible possession of them nothing in fact short of the absolute necessity produced by mrs beauchamp's request could have given her courage to issue the command she had pronounced to cleopatra and joyful was she oh very joyful when she perceived one division of her unwieldy armament thus far advanced on its march towards her own quarters what then were her emotions on entering her room to see all her eight hampers spreading themselves far and wide before her eyes and the well-pleased cleopatra grinning in the midst of them she seized upon matilda's arm and grasped it fondly isn't that a comfort matilda she exclaimed i have hardly ever said a word about it even to the major but i declare to you upon my honour and life matilda that i always felt as if i never should get them all together again miss matilda stared with the most unaffected astonishment at the display which so enchanted her friend hampers 
she exclaimed in an accent which expressed better than any words could have done how perfectly unintelligible their appearance was to her yes my dear hampers returned their happy owner laughing heartily do you think i have brought over a stock of wine in them matilda then turning to the negress while she honourably drew forth the promised levy value eleven pence she said and where are the people who have helped you to bring all these up cleopatra the people is me own self missis replied the girl holding out her hand for the well-deserved gratuity well to be sure you are a strong girl i didn't quite intend to be giving three fips at a time to any nigger but there you shall have it as you have done the job so quickly but remember all madame tornorino's things are to be brought up too however i can tell you for your comfort that there is not one half so many as mine i'm sure i don't know how it is matilda i have always dressed patty uncommonly elegant as you well know and i should not say i had ever begrudged her anything should you and yet somehow or other it always happens that i get quantities more things for myself that does look a monstrous sight of dresses doesn't it matilda dresses exclaimed the still mystified matilda do all those wine hampers contain dresses mrs o mrs allen barnaby you shall see my dear was the reply just hand me over that razor of the major's will you matilda now then which shall we begin with let me see if i can remember anything about it my court dress is in the biggest of all that's it isn't it let us begin with that the major's razor was sharp and true the stout whipcord snapped before it again again and again till the top was fairly disengaged on all sides and fell creaking to the ground mrs allen barnaby hastily snatched away the linen wrappers which still intervened between her and her court dress and then stood gazing upon it as it lay richly heaped in all its splendour with an intensity of pleasurable emotion to which the pencil could do better justice than the pen alas the poor matilda how stood she the while all the finery she had in the world had crossed the ocean in one trunk two bandboxes and a bag and all the consolation which the unpacking handling and setting it in order could convey to her spirit had been already enjoyed at that moment perhaps she did envy mrs allen barnaby notwithstanding her large waist and her grey hairs but a little reflection caused her to turn her eyes towards the looking-glass whence the youthful contour of her figure greeted her so cheeringly that her spirits revived and she set about the business she was summoned to perform almost without breathing a sigh though she had to hand out from this and the seven following hampers not less than thirty-two dresses three cloaks five shawls nine scarfs sixteen fichus and twenty-eight embroidered collars nevertheless the operation was certainly in some degree a painful one yet it was soothed by the delightful consciousness that not one of all the things she saw and handled but would look five thousand times better upon her than upon its owner and thus passed the hours till the first dinner-bell gave notice that it was time to dress miss matilda heard it with joy and gladness mrs allen barnaby with dismay she had not found lodging-room notwithstanding mrs carmichael's very handsome assignment of drawers for one half of her belongings and now actually wrung her hands almost in despair as she exclaimed oh matilda matilda what am i to do with my three velvets we must think of that another time my dear mrs o allen barnaby replied the young lady giving notice that it was her decided intention to depart by walking straight towards the door and instantly opening it i have got something very particular to do to the cap i am going to wear at dinner to-day she said and i can't stay a minute longer before she could be answered she was gone and the perplexed mrs allen barnaby looked round her with the mixed feeling of enjoyment and distress so frequently produced by the embarras des richesses at this moment her husband entered for the purpose of preparing himself for dinner and great was his astonishment at the spectacle that greeted him the eight huge hampers though emptied of their contents occupied not the less space on that account but so choked up the room with their bulk that it seemed nearly impossible to get across it what on earth are you about wife he exclaimed and not perhaps in the gentlest of accents what is the good of dragging out all this trumpery if we are to start away up the mississippi in a week or so is it for the pleasure of looking at it all upon my soul i did not think you were such a fool 
strong in conscious innocence my admirable heroine lost not her temper but explained to him as he performed his ablutions after having scrambled over the obstacles which impeded his approach to the washing-stand how absolutely necessary it was that she should comply with the marked request of mrs beauchamp and show that she had some dresses fit for a christian to wear it is quite plain to me donny she continued soothingly handing him his rose-coloured satin cravat perfectly plain and clear that mrs beauchamp who is evidently a remarkably sensible woman does not choose to commit herself by introducing strangers of whom she knows no more than the child unborn to all the best families of new orleans now she knows as well as i do that dress speaks for itself and though she did it in a very genteel ladylike way i don't greatly doubt i promise you that if i had made any shuffling excuses about not liking to unpack my things we should presently have found her as shy as you please about introducing us but everything will go right now depend upon it just ask yourself if anybody in their senses could look upon such dresses as these and feel any doubt of the high respectability of the person to whom they belong just ask yourself major to be sure there is something in that replied the reasonable husband but how in the world my dear did you contrive to collect such an immense quantity of rich expensive-looking dresses are they all paid for my barnaby my dear major i always consider that to be a question between myself and my conscience with which nobody not even you my dear has any right to meddle i know my own heart donny and when i feel that it is for the advantage of my husband and child to do a thing i do it without stopping to consider what anybody else may think of it if everybody did the same major allen barnaby you may depend upon it the world would be a deal better than it is but i am sorry to say that duty is often and often put out of sight and that too by people who fancy they are mighty good i thank heaven that i know what's right better than that comes to and it is not a little that will stop me nor ever did when i feel that i am doing my duty to my family you are a charming woman my dear returned the major with a very gallant air and as i have often told you before were certainly made on purpose for me but hark there goes that gong of a dinner-bell come along my dear i suppose i must sit by mrs beauchamp again to-day as i have begun to do it though i have no particular object in it now don't say so my dear donny replied his lady looking at him rather reproachfully remember that as a husband and a father you have your duties to perform as well as myself you have still a great deal to do my dear as yet you have only made her understand that i am a woman of genius and a writer greatly approved in my own country and you should go on now to dwell upon our position in fashionable society and among people of rank why my dear replied the major giving a last brush to his whiskers they one and all of them hate people of rank they say so every moment almost mrs allen barnaby drew on her black silk mittens smiled and nodded her head major said she while her eyes assumed an exceedingly clever expression major don't be affronted but you don't see so far into a stone wall as i do don't i my dear why how far do you see just far enough to convince me that they just dote upon titles and rank as much as ever i did when i used to toady that horrid old cat lady susan and that's saying a good deal yes so it is my dear replied her husband but if you say as much in your book i don't think it will answer no more do i my dear she rejoined but come along donny come to dinner don't be afraid you may trust me chapter fifteen various sentiments progress between the dramatis personae powerful effect of drapery in a picture mrs colonel beauchamp enlightens the mind of her new friend on the subject of negro slavery annie beauchamp's affection for miss louisa perkins increases which appears to disgust mr egerton exceedingly the dinner of this day passed very much as the others had done mrs carmichael wheezed and ate and hoped the gentlemen and ladies found the canvas backs and a hominy good and then wheezed again major allen barnaby did his very best to confirm all mrs beauchamp's favourable impressions respecting the excellent standing of himself and his family his lady sat dispensing smiles around the very picture of admiring observation and travelling intelligence miss louisa perkins unexpectedly found annie beauchamp seated next to her and therefore felt herself considerably nearer being comfortable than at any moment since she first breathed the air of the united states for she heard herself repeatedly spoken to and that with the most engaging kindness and good-nature 
miss matilda believed herself to be looking much better than usual having very successfully altered her blonde and amber cap and got her hair to curl and hang beautifully patty pinched her husband's elbow and laughed loud with delight when he turned suddenly round to see what was the matter mr egerton talked a good deal to miss beauchamp and flattered himself that he had made her exceedingly angry and the rest of the good company went on very much as usual but on the following morning several important circumstances occurred tending greatly to change the position of our travellers and to advance each and every of them in the direction they wished to pursue before leaving the room where the boarders breakfasted mrs allen barnaby made her way to the side of mrs beauchamp and lowering her voice to a confidential tone said whenever you like to come to my room my dear madam i shall be ready to see you i have now got a few of the dresses unpacked about which i desire to consult you this was enough to secure the immediate attendance of the lady whose good opinion she wished to propitiate and who had indeed feeling stronger than mere curiosity to make her accept the invitation never perhaps had mrs allen barnaby displayed more acuteness than when she guessed that mrs beauchamp was anxious to ascertain the style of her wardrobe before she ventured upon introducing her and her family to any persons of louisianian importance this was precisely the fact not that mrs beauchamp entertained the slightest doubt of mrs allen barnaby's being a person of great talent of that she felt sufficiently assured by the manner in which she admired everything she saw but as it appeared that the party had omitted to bring letters of introduction to new orleans which the major accounted for by saying that their original intention had been to sail to new york she confessed to her husband that she knew no other safe and sure criterion excepting dress whereby she could sufficiently ascertain their standing to justify her introducing them to her tip-top friends and to confess the truth the note which was to secure the strangers an invitation had yet to be written mrs allen barnaby found means to watch with a good deal of tact and without at all betraying her deep interest in the matter the sort and degree of effect produced by the display of her rich suits upon her american friend nor had she any reason to feel disappointed at the result of the experiment mrs beauchamp indeed said little much less than was usual with her on most occasions but she looked she touched she meditated and she reasoned the two ladies moved gently about from chair to chair from the bed to the sofa and from the sofa to the bed without any of the bustling noisy discussion which such an examination generally produces between female friends indeed very little was said by either of them mrs beauchamp understood good manners a great deal too well to give utterance to the increased and still increasing esteem to which the velvet satin and lace displayed before her gave birth while mrs allen barnaby felt too much alive to the importance of that esteem to interfere with the mental process which she clearly saw was going on to augment it the first words however or nearly so which were spoken while this examination lasted were uttered by the owner of the articles which pleaded thus trumpet-mouthed for her gentility mrs allen barnaby said at length but in an accent very nearly of indifference you must not forget you know my dear mrs beauchamp that you promised to tell me whether the style of any of these dresses would be fit for the society to which you have so kindly offered to present me no indeed my dear ma'am returned mrs beauchamp i am not going to do any such thing i assure you and i am happy to say that i don't see any one thing among all these handsome articles which you might not put on with the very greatest propriety when visiting any of the great families here when you have been a little longer in the country my dear mrs allen barnaby you will find out i am sure for you are a great deal too smart and observing to miss seeing it that this southern part of the union enjoys a much higher class of society than those who have been ill-advised enough to make themselves free states they grovel as we all say in the very outskirts of civilization and have just missed the only way to make a republic in any degree elegant and respectable and the cause is plain to those who don't shut their eyes on purpose because they won't see for it's easy enough to guess that no white free-born americans whether men women or children will choose to make household drudges of themselves and work for wages it follows in course then you see that we must either scrub and rub and toil and sweat for ourselves like so many downright savages or else that we must make use of the creatures that we have luckily got hold of that are neither white nor free-born and make them do what it is quite positively necessary that ladies and gentlemen must have done for them 
while these words were spoken mrs allen barnaby stood with her hands clasped together and her eyes fixed on the speaker with the air of one who is listening to the most important information that one human being can bestow upon another every word you utter my dear madam she said convinces me that providence has thrown me in your way in order to prevent my putting forth to the world with the authority of my name which truth at this moment obliges me to confess is not inconsiderable any of those false views on the subject of negro slavery which i blush to say are too freely propagated in europe i see at once the full force of your argument and you will do me a great favour if you will just sit down here for a moment while i make a memorandum of your observation never mind that crimson velvet dress my dear mrs beauchamp it was made at paris last year but you know the great misfortune of velvets is that they are eternal my exclaimed mrs beauchamp following with her eyes the splendid robe with its gold stomacher as it was thrown carelessly aside in order to give her a chair i expect it looks as if it was made yesterday i do wish mrs allen barnaby that if we go all together to-night to judge johnson's you would just wear that gown it is first-rate elegant and i expect there's nobody so stupid as not to see that and don't you mind it's being hot weather mrs allen barnaby we can learn you to fix the things under so that you will hardly feel the difference most assuredly i will wear that dress if you approve of it my dear mrs beauchamp was the obliging reply but spoken with the sort of dignified indifference which a queen might have shown upon a similar occasion mrs allen barnaby now took her new note-book and pencil out of her table drawer and sitting down before it said in a tone which formed a charming contrast to that in which she had spoken of her dress may i ask you my dearest madam to repeat to me a few words of what you were saying just now this will amply suffice to recall the general bearing of your admirable and unanswerable argument i expect that what i was saying was about the ridiculous impossibility of republican gentlemen and ladies doing for themselves without the assistance of niggers and what i think is the best argument of all mrs allen barnaby is just this i want the abolitionists to be pleased to tell us which they calculate is the greatest sin the letting black heathen nigger creatures what grows wild in their own woods for all the world like so many painters and polecats i want to know i say whether it's wickeder to let them do the work of the union or to put it upon the gentlemen and ladies of the republic to do it for themselves and them the very people that the immortal washington fought for the very people who got done finish the glorious fourth of july work and that now stands in the face of all europeans as the pattern people of the world which of the two is it that ought to do the dirty work is it the heroes of the stars and the stripes or is it the nigger slaves what belongs to them mrs beauchamp said all this slowly and deliberately and the more so as she observed that her friend was earnestly engaged the while in writing as soon as the sentence had reached its conclusion mrs allen barnaby raised her eyes fixed them solemnly on the face of her eloquent and animated companion and having gazed at her for a moment she exclaimed i never did no never in my whole life hear anything put so clear and convincing as that why anybody that doesn't see the truth of it must be as stupid as the dirt under their feet no no it is not so much stupidity my dear mrs allen barnaby replied the patriotic lady as downright good-for-nothing wickedness they do all see it they must see it they must know that a white man a white american republican is better than a nasty filthy black nigger slave but that's the shocking part of the business my dear lady they see it and yet they won't say so on account of their poisonous party spirit and it is just that which threatens the safety of the finest part of the union and the only part sufficiently advanced in the elegances of civilization to get themselves looked up to by europeans this was said with so much vehemence so much bitterness and such heightened colour that the acute mrs allen barnaby saw at once how very near and how very important a subject they were discussing and she quietly determined to act accordingly she raised her hand to her forehead which she pressed forcibly as if to still its painful throbbings 
she sighed then sat motionless a while then sighed again and at length in a voice as deep and solemn as that of mrs siddons herself she said i feel that this is important this awfully important subject excites my mind too strongly it will require many solitary hours of deep thoughtfulness to represent it to the world in the light in which it ought to be viewed i see all all now as clearly as the sun at noon to-day and it shall not be my fault if europe does not see it too then you see it as i do my excellent clear-headed mrs allen barnaby you range yourself on the side of the persecuted slaveholders exclaimed mrs beauchamp i do indeed replied the authoress in a tone of the most dignified decision then if i don't prove myself worthy of such a friend may i never be waited upon by a slave again returned mrs beauchamp suddenly rising and now mrs allen barnaby i must leave you for i have many things to do i hope we shall enjoy our party to-night i am told it is to be a very gay one you are aware my dear madam said our traveller remembering her husband's hint that we english ladies never pay visits unaccompanied by our husbands and it does you honour ma'am great honour the ladies of the union are first-rate particular in that line themselves in course my friends will expect the company of the major and not only that i can tell you the whole party of a lady of your views will be welcome go where you will in this part of the country and that if you made up altogether half a score instead of half a dozen you are exceedingly kind and polite replied mrs allen barnaby feeling to her very fingers ends the strength of her present position and only hesitating in her acceptance of this wholesale hospitality from thinking it possible that she might turn the glowing sentiment of gratitude she had excited more exclusively to her own profit exceedingly obliging indeed but i do not think there is any necessity to trouble you with such a very large party our good friends the perkinses are certainly the best creatures in the world and i am only too happy to have them with me in attendance upon me i might in fact say but there is no occasion whatever to ask for their being invited on the present occasion it may be a check perhaps on future hospitality you are very considerate and thoughtful my dear ma'am replied mrs beauchamp and perhaps it may be as well at this moment madame tornorino entered her mother's apartment and asking in her usual unembarrassed manner what they were talking about was immediately made acquainted with the point they were discussing how can you be so abominably ill-natured mamma said the bride with some vehemence when you know matilda is my particular friend pray ma'am get her invited if you can for i shall have no fun if she doesn't go as to louisa indeed she may just as well stay at home for she is too dull for anything mrs beauchamp declared madame tornorino was the liveliest young lady she had ever seen but added that she could not stay another minute to listen to her as she had forgotten to explain properly to her friend mrs judge johnson about who she was to have the happiness of seeing and she must write to her again directly and she did write to her concerning the large party of additional guests whom she requested her to invite but not again inasmuch as she had never before written a word upon the subject having waited as before stated for some satisfactory proof of the allen barnaby race being worthy of the promised honour but on this point assurance had indeed become doubly sure nobody who knew anything of the higher classes in any country could doubt for a moment as she told mrs judge johnson that such dresses must belong to a real lady but what she added was that compared to the high-minded feelings and the extraordinary ability she had shown upon the subject so near to all their hearts in short she explained her motives so clearly and expressed them so well that as quickly as the black messenger could go and return mrs beauchamp was in possession of a note that authorized her to bring with her the five friends she had named the five friends said annie when her mother communicated the note to her yes all you know except that poor melancholy-looking one that does not seem as if she could take pleasure in anything the eldest of the two miss perkinses you mean said annie yes my dear well then mamma i shall stay at home with her said the young lady with all the pertinacity of a spoiled child you stay at home annie my daughter you must be out of your wits to say so 
i should like to know what father would say to that but the young lady persisted and as generally happens in such cases the mamma gave way miss louisa was taught to consider herself invited and mrs beauchamp made up her mind to smuggle her in among the rest or if challenged as to their numbers to declare that it was a blunder of her foolish annie's it so chanced that this little debate between mrs beauchamp and her daughter took place in the great saloon while some few of the boarders were waiting there in expectation of the dinner-bell and among them was mr frederick egerton this young man had been vacillating a little respecting his immediate departure from new orleans it had occurred to him that he had not yet seen enough of the singular forest around it with its rich palmetto shrubs and its heavy pendant moss and he had pretty well made up his mind to stay another week he was one of those who had been honoured by a verbal invitation from the hon judge johnson himself for the party of the evening but he had prudently given an uncertain answer and in truth had decided upon avoiding so warm a ceremony but his curiosity was now piqued to know why that little obstinate thoroughbred american girl insisted so rudely and so vehemently upon being accompanied by that deplorable-looking miss perkins she has got some horribly vulgar american joke in her head i am quite sure of it he muttered to himself and if i am broiled for it i will certainly go in order to find out what it is how i do detest american jokes End of chapters 14 and 15chapter 16 of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 16 a new orleans route of first-rate splendor mrs allen barnaby in all her glory miss beauchamp and mr egerton dance together the gentleman conceives some kindness for miss louisa perkins miss matilda perkins is translated to the seventh heaven together with her friend mrs allen barnaby the drawing-rooms of mrs judge johnson like many others in new orleans were large lofty and handsome and on the present occasion very tolerably lighted so that mrs allen barnaby and her party felt on entering them all the delight of reviving hope for the future the rooms were already very nearly full colonel and mrs beauchamp being always very late owing to the gentleman's evening nap which nothing was ever permitted to interfere with but this circumstance only added to the gratification of our party proving to them at once by one heart-cheering coup d'oeil that they were as mrs allen barnaby emphatically expressed it once more in the land of the living isn't it a comfort patty said she making a sudden step forward and clutching her daughter's arm isn't it a comfort to see so many full-dressed people again i swear that i dreamt half a dozen times at the very least when i was aboard ship that the devil or something like him came and told me i should never put my foot in a ballroom again and you see that dreams do go by contraries isn't it delightful patty lor mamma how you do pull me said patty in return endeavouring to withdraw herself from the maternal grasp in order not to be separated from her husband who was drawing her forward yes yes to be sure it is very delightful only let me go at this moment mrs judge johnson a very thin lady of about five-and-thirty came forward from the crowd that surrounded her and to whom she was giving in the strictest confidence a few hints as to who was coming with all the interesting particulars now attached to the names of allen barnaby the interest and curiosity thus excited was of the most animating kind and produced so evident a desire to behold the celebrated heroine of the tale that mrs allen barnaby had the exquisite gratification of finding herself the object upon which every eye was fixed perhaps her heart had never beat so joyously since the moment of her first introduction to lord mucklebury with the acuteness which made so remarkable a feature in her character she saw at a single glance what was going on and understood it too completely do you see donny do you see she whispered in the ear of her husband on whose arm she was now stalking forward with indescribable dignity to receive the welcome of her hostess don't they all look as if they were ready to worship me i have not told you yet all that i have been hearing and saying about the niggers mrs judge johnson having now succeeded in getting within speaking distance of her illustrious guest made a curtsey at once becoming the dignity of a judge's lady and the cordial hospitality of a louisianian patriot upon receiving a lady about to write a book on the principles avowed by mrs allen barnaby and which were already pretty generally known throughout the room 
ah can't be thankful enough i'm sure ma'am to my obliging friend mrs colonel beauchamp for bringing me and the judge acquainted with a european lady of your standing and great ability there has been a great deal of ill blood brewed and evil seed sown between our two countries by the vile abominable lies and slanders that some of your travelling authors have propagated against us and to such a lady as you are i expect this must be as hateful as it is to us but if what we hear of you is true ma'am which we cannot doubt seeing it comes from mrs colonel beauchamp of big gang bank if all the good we hear of you is true you shall find that we are not people to take up prejudices against all for the faults and the crimes of some you will find yourself as much honoured here mrs allen barnaby as if you were a free-born citizen of our glorious soil we have no prejudices against the english notwithstanding all the ill they have done us all we ask at their hands is a fair and honest account of the glories of our unrivalled government and the splendour of our institutions and this is just what we never get from them for it is a common saying among us that the bigness of their lives is in proportion to the littleness of their country but by you ma'am we expect to be treated differently and different as you will find will be the return and this honourable gentleman is i expect the major your husband he is heartily welcome ma'am for your sake and so are all the rest of the ladies and gentlemen and would be if there was double the number just in time too here comes the honourable judge johnson my husband judge this is the lady from england as we were talking of but now you remember and she whispered something in his ear and this is a major of england her husband and these are her sons and daughters i believe or her very particular friends all come out to travel with her and to help her may be in giving a fair and just account of us at last mrs judge johnson was one of those ladies who when they begin a speech never seem to know how to leave off again it is probable she would not have ended there had not the judge began to speak himself and whenever this happened she immediately ceased an example which it would be well if many ladies of many countries followed the judge however had certainly a particularly good right to the privilege thus accorded him because it was very rarely that in his own house he spoke at all he was a senator and in the chamber of the legislature was celebrated for his eloquence but elsewhere he was generally speaking a very silent man he was one of those who had with the utmost consistency of purpose and unvarying steadiness of principle persevered in advocating the righteousness of the slavery system against all the attacks made upon it by those whose notions of freedom as a national characteristic were founded on rather a broader basis than his own it was he who with the most constantly sustained and most acrimonious vehemence had through session after session browbeat abused and ridiculed the bold men who had ventured to attack this darling idol of the slave states and he was reverenced accordingly by those who worshipped it this honourable gentleman almost rivalled his lady though with fewer words in expressing the height length and breadth of the affection and esteem which he ever held ready to bestow on all persons willing to come forward in support of what he was wont to call his principles men of all lands when they talk of their principles generally look conscientious and sublime and so did the honourable judge johnson you might have thought to look at him when he was haranguing on the immutable nature of right of the heaven-born holiness of justice of the sinful weakness of permitting vacillating laws and untried innovations to sap and undermine the venerable institutions of the republic that it was a martyr who was preaching in support of a holy but painful doctrine which none but the steadfastly pure and holy-minded had courage to defend and accordingly he was universally characterized by every citizen who possessed a slave throughout the union as one of the worthiest and most high-minded men that ever lived as true as steel and as honest as a day and those who hung all their hopes of continued prosperity upon the system he supported might well speak thus of him for if he was right there he was wrong in nothing else in nothing at least in which this principle was not so vitally mixed as to make part and parcel of the thing itself he was himself a strict liver in all ways 
but if it chanced that any instances came before him of the licentious immorality which inevitably arises from the monstrous union in partition which this fearful system produces his strict morality seemed to melt away like wax before the sun and till he was again heard to speak upon some theme where this did not interfere the honourable mr judge johnson might be mistaken for the most licentious man alive of all this however major and mrs allen barnaby knew very little and of course cared considerably less they were both all bows amenity and smiles the lady moved her plumes shook her perfumed locks and declared that new orleans seemed to her a perfect paradise i had no idea of seeing such a room of elegant company as this it almost perfectly equals anything in london my own last party to be sure was more numerous and as many of the ladies wore their court dresses because we were all at the drawing-room that morning it was more but luckily before she finished her sentence a contracted brow or two among the group she was addressing reminded her of the outbreak of her friend mrs beauchamp when the court of queen victoria had been alluded to on a former occasion therefore suddenly stopping short she looked round her with a sort of renewed delight and then exclaimed with very captivating naivete but oh good gracious what use is it to talk of london or paris or any other place in the world for where did any one ever see in the same number so many beautiful elegant dressed women or so many noble dignified looking men i am very glad to find you are struck with that my dear mrs allen barnaby said mrs beauchamp in an audible whisper and throwing her handsome patriotic eyes over the group of tall republicans who standing in a cluster behind the judge were gazing with very eager curiosity at the lady who it was rumoured was come all the way from the old country on purpose to do them justice and to write about them and their nasty niggers in the proper style i am very glad you are struck with that she repeated with energy because in this part of the union we do rather pride ourselves upon the elegant style of our gentlemen all the young ladies in the united states you know are counted pretty some more and some less of course but it is in vain to deny that it is only in the slave states that the gentlemen look first-rate and the reason is so plain if people would but give themselves the trouble to understand it for it's only in the slave states in course that a citizen is a master as well as a man and what right i should like to know have those europeans who clamour against our negro slavery to insist upon it that american gentlemen shall be the only gentlemen in the world who can't say that much for themselves a very audible murmur of applause ran round the circle which had now surrounded the strangers at this sally and devilish smart woman that was heard from various quarters mr egerton who had been in the room some time before the arrival of mrs beauchamp's party had by this time made his way up to it an effort which he had probably been disposed to make because the individuals composing it were the only ones in the room save the hon judge johnson himself whom he knew by name or with whom he had ever exchanged a syllable mrs beauchamp in her eagerness to perform properly all the duties of a chaperon to mrs allen barnaby had dropped the arm of her daughter on entering the room saying you know everybody in the room annie so you won't want me but let who will come to you be sure to keep civil with the english people finding herself thus alone miss beauchamp looked round her before she took another step in advance not so much however to see with whom she should join herself as how most securely to avoid the proximity and conversation of madame tornorino for whom she had conceived an aversion even greater than the fact of her being english could account for having ascertained in what direction she and her loving husband had turned she next looked about her for the other individuals of the party for whom her mother had requested her civility and perceiving that the favoured matilda had received permission to place the tips of her fingers on the gallant arm of patty's don she looked about her and for some time in vain for the melancholy louisa and at last found her considerably in rear of the party of course utterly alone and with an air as utterly desolate annie instantly stepped back and joined her offering her delicate arm smiling exceedingly like an angel of light and beginning to talk to her about the room and the people as if they had been intimately acquainted for months the sadness of the melancholy louisa gave way before all this unlooked-for kindness and being really as good-natured a woman as ever lived she soon got talking and laughing with her young companion in a much gayer style than was quite usual with her 
for even before she had been beguiled into leaving her country the constant anxiety in which she lived respecting her sister's unpromising project of getting a husband had rendered the life of miss louisa far from a happy one on perceiving the pleasant effect her attentions produced on the person whose quiet sadness had so moved her young heart to compassion annie redoubled her efforts to be amusing and at the moment mr egerton reached the place where she and miss louisa were standing a little apart from the crowd that surrounded the great lion of the evening annie had made her companion laugh heartily and was looking the very picture of gaiety and good humour herself mr egerton before he spoke to them gazed at her for a moment in astonishment and it might be perhaps a little in admiration miss beauchamp was not on this occasion dressed in her robe of brown holland but as far as form went was hardly less simply clad and as the material was white muslin without any mixture of colour or decoration of any kind her appearance was still as remarkable for its quiet neatness as before one ornament however she had which was the full-blown flower of a snow-white japonica which she had fastened gracefully enough on one side of her head having indulged unseen in looking at her for a minute or two mr egerton stepped forward and made himself visible bowing civilly to the elder lady and expressing his hope that he saw the younger well oh dear what a pity that matilda is not here exclaimed the kind louisa in her heart this is the very gentleman she was so anxious to be introduced to and now he seems quite inclined to get acquainted her sister however was too far off to be summoned by any becks or winks that she could set in action and all she could do was to return his civility in the most obliging manner which she did by curtsying to him three times successively miss beauchamp meanwhile from the unexpected suddenness of mr egerton's address or from some other cause perhaps her extreme dislike of him coloured violently but soon recovered both from the laughter he had interrupted and the slight agitation he had produced and then her manner became again as cold as distant and as disdainful as it had ever been when conversing with him it is not very easy for a gentleman to keep up a conversation under such circumstances especially when so large a portion of contempt and dislike mixes with his own feelings but with a sort of pertinacious obstinacy mr egerton was determined that he would talk to miss beauchamp it might be that he hoped to plague her or it might be that he hoped to amuse himself with her transatlantic idiom but let the reason be what it might he was very steadfast in his purpose and on seeing the young people preparing to dance actually proposed himself to her as a partner annie looked at him with considerable surprise and certainly her first impulse was to decline the offered honour but she was very fond of dancing and if she refused him she could not dance with another without a degree of rudeness which nothing but a fresh outbreak on his part in praise of his own country could have given her a courage for she therefore after a little delay that was just long enough to be uncourteous bowed her consent and he presented his arm she looked at him as american young ladies always do look on such occasions before they have visited europe and walked on beside him in silence but without accepting it and hereupon mr egerton passed judgment upon her with a spice of european injustice for totally ignorant of the law which forbids young ladies to walk lock and lock with young gentlemen he conceived her rejection of this ordinary piece of civility to be only an additional proof of her determination to be rude to him they had not however proceeded three steps in advance before annie inexpressibly provoked at herself for her thoughtlessness which really surprised as much as it vexed her turned suddenly back again to poor louisa and kindly taking her hand which she drew under her arm she said my dear miss perkins i don't know what i was thinking of to leave you in this way i expect you must think me the very rudest person you ever saw let me take you to your party before i begin dancing shall we look for your sister or for mrs allen barnaby thank you my dear young lady you are very very kind to me always replied the really grateful louisa if you can find out mrs allen barnaby for me i shall be very glad because do you know i should like to ask her if she thinks it would be possible to get a partner for my sister matilda will it please you miss perkins if she gets a partner said annie please me my dear miss beauchamp oh dear oh dear i should be so delighted i really can't tell you how delighted i should be then just stay here one moment will you with your countryman mr egerton and i will see if i can manage it without troubling mrs allen barnaby and so saying she glided away leaving the not too well matched compatriots side by side you seem to have become already extremely intimate with that young american lady miss perkins said the gentleman do you find her very agreeable 
i find her sir the very sweetest kindest young creature i ever met with in my whole life replied the grateful louisa with a degree of emotion that communicated itself to her voice i really do think that if i saw much of her i should grow to love her a great deal too well she being an american foreigner which would make it seem almost wrong and unnatural i am afraid why really miss perkins if you feel thus strongly already i should be apt to think that you might carry your partiality rather farther than was reasonable for you can have seen but very little of her and that is quite true sir certainly but very great sweetness and very great kindness will go to one's heart i believe without taking a great deal of time for it the handsome gallant gay young egerton looked in the pale face of the still dismal-looking old maid with a considerable approach towards good fellowship perhaps miss perkins you patronize pretty young ladies said he smiling and i won't deny that miss beauchamp is very pretty though she is so thoroughly american pretty sir is that all you can say i do think she is the most perfect beauty that ever was looked at yes yes he replied laughing she is quite sufficiently beautiful and i see i was right in supposing that this is the reason you have taken such a fancy to her then without wishing to be rude sir she replied very earnestly instead of being right i must tell you that you are quite wrong i don't believe at all that i have any particular liking for beauty there's my sister's particular friend miss patty madame tornorino i mean i have heard that she is considered quite a complete beauty and i do assure you sir that since she has been fully grown up i have sometimes taxed myself with being very ill-humoured and unamiable about it for the handsomer she seemed to get the more i seemed to dislike looking at her again mr egerton laughed but by no means impertinently and though he did not think it discreet to tell the lady how very well he understood and how very much he sympathized with her he did offer his arm to conduct her to a seat saying that he would watch for the return of miss beauchamp but before miss louisa could express her sense of his obligingness or do anything more than wish that it was her sister matilda instead of herself that he was so polite to annie returned bringing the glad tidings that she had got one of the best partners in the room for miss matilda and now tell me she added where shall i leave you oh just there if you please my dear where this gentleman was going to get me a seat before you came back but shall you not like better to be with your party said annie mrs allen barnaby has got all the grandeur of new orleans around her should not you like to get a place near her i am sure i can manage it no thank you my dear replied miss louisa rather hastily i would a great deal rather sit here by myself if you please again mr egerton felt a strong movement of sympathy towards the old maid and it seemed as if he thought not of his beautiful partner till he had conducted her to the seat she desired to occupy then however he returned with no very lingering step to the spot where he had left annie conversing with some of her acquaintance whom he heard entreating her as he came up to get them an introduction to the celebrated mrs allen barnaby by this time the gentlemen dancers were all leading their partners to their places and mr egerton perceived that the manner in which this ceremony was performed was by the gentleman's taking the hand of the lady in the good old sir charles grandison style and so parading her to the place she was to occupy they took their station at the side of the quadrille which gave them time for a little conversation before the figure of the dance called upon them to begin your antipathy towards the degenerated inhabitants of the old country miss beauchamp seems to have relaxed in one instance at least you are exceedingly kind and attentive to that poor unhappy-looking miss perkins i don't think she is unhappy-looking at all replied annie evasively not at least when she has anything in the world to make her look cheerful i never saw any one more easily pleased in my life and you really appear to take pleasure in producing this metamorphosis from grave to gay returned mr egerton and i could understand this very well if she were not an englishwoman but as it is i confess to you that i am somewhat puzzled to understand why you have so decidedly taken her into favour annie looked at him for a moment as if doubtful how to answer and then said with a little air as if she had at length made up her mind i will tell you the reason mr egerton miss perkins is the only person i have ever heard of i will not say conversed with though it would sound better but i have scarcely conversed with any miss perkins is the only english person i ever heard of who did not think him or herself vastly superior to everybody else in the world 
she poor thing is exactly the contrary for she has every symptom of believing herself inferior to everybody and that is the reason why i think her the most interesting individual of the english party at mrs carmichael's the english party at mrs carmichael's muttered mr egerton to himself and then he and his fair partner were called upon to perform their part in the dance meanwhile the happiness of miss matilda was almost greater than anything she had ever dared again to hope for at a ball when endeavouring to obtain a partner for her miss beauchamp had not scrupled to hint that she was as it were part and parcel of that celebrated mrs allen barnaby who was come from england to new orleans on purpose to write a book in praise of the united states and in defence of the slave system not only was this enough to procure the gentleman to whom it was addressed as a partner in the first quadrille but no less than three others solicited the honour of her hand before the first set was over for the subsequent dances those who know anything of miss matilda perkins can be at no loss to imagine her feelings nor was her friend and patroness less happy senators members of congress lawyers writers and statesmen all crowded round her and seemed to vie with each other in demonstrations of esteem and admiration the heart of my heroine whispered to her this is what i was born for this is my real vocation her well-pleased husband lingered near her long enough to see how admirably well she bore her honours and then giving her unseen by all one very little wink of satisfaction turned away confessing to the honourable judge johnson who at that moment made the inquiry that he had no objection whatever to a rubber the fair patty was in short the only one of the party who did not think this visit very delightful but being absolutely obliged to give up her husband to her papa who had become so attached to him as to resolve upon never playing a game of cards of any kind without having him near his person she found very little fun even in dancing because of course now as she rather pettishly muttered to herself nobody could dare to make love to her for fear the don should snap his nose off before she left the room however she too came in for a share of the honours of the evening for a certain mrs general gregory a lady very richly dressed and having every appearance of being a person of great consequence made acquaintance with her by admiring her gown this led to other subjects and as patty was not disposed to dance much mrs general gregory had so advanced the acquaintance before they parted as to promise to come and call upon her and her mamma at the boarding-house this greatly revived the spirits of patty for the lady talked of her carriage and her horses and her servants and occasionally of the general her husband so that our young bride again felt that she too was somebody but after all it was mrs allen barnaby herself who was in truth the well-head and spring of all these honours she was herself fully aware of this and enjoyed the glorious prospect opening before her with all the native energy of her character the last words she uttered to her husband before wishing him finally good night will show the acuteness with which she read the causes that had produced such agreeable effects i say donny do you think i shall find a word or two to say in praise of slavery won't i my dear that's all End of chapter sixteen